So, for 20 years, Charlie worked in a factory, and every evening he would walk past the gate and the guard pushing a wheelbarrow full of sawdust. And the guard was suspicious. He said, I know you're stealing something. And he would sift through the sawdust, wouldn't find anything. And every day for 20 years this happened. He, Charlie would go through and the guy would say, oh, i got to check the sawdust. And he said, I know you're stealing something. And he would look, never found anything. So finally Charlie retired. And at the retirement party, the guard went to Charlie and said, look, there's nothing lost now. But I'm dying, and I know you're stealing something. What have you been stealing? Anybody know this? The answer is wheelbarrows. <laughs> Missing the obvious. I like that as an introduction. Is it possible for something to be just comically obvious and for us not to see it. That's a pretty good way to introduce John's Gospel. Because the Son of God appeared, did a ton of signs and wonders and teaching, rode into Jerusalem as the king, and basically said, ah, do you get it? And basically Jerusalem said, get what? What are we supposed to see? And the Jews and the nation of Israel missed the most obvious thing. It's the wheelbarrow. <laughs> it's the... So here we go. Missing the obvious, the story of the wheelbarrow. Uh, hidden in plain sight. I don't know where that phrase comes from, but that's a, another way to say what I'm trying to say. The public ministry of Jesus climaxes uh, in chapter 12, and what we've seen is the raising of Lazarus, and we got this impression the whole city of Jerusalem is so upset about Lazarus coming back to dead that the Pharisees say, now we've got to kill not only Jesus, but we've got to kill Lazarus. Because it's just very public. The triumphal entry, Jesus comes into his capital city as the king, accepts the adulation of the crowds, doesn't rebuke them, and the Pharisees close that passage by saying, look, the whole world has gone to him, including the Greeks, who show up and say, we would see Jesus. I mean, so this is big. This is very public. It climaxes with the raising of Lazarus, the triumphal entry, and even a voice from heaven just make sure we get it, because that, are you in John 12? This is really one of my favorite passages in all the Bible, because how many people have said, well, if only God would speak from heaven, that would, of course, make me a follower. I would, of course, believe. Well, here it is, John chapter 12, uh, verse 27. Jesus says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I've come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven so that the whole city of Jerusalem heard this. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said, never heard thunder like that before. <laughs> Others said, must be an angel. And Jesus said, the voice came for your benefit, not mine. Now's the judgment of the world. And I think what he means is, you folks that heard that are going to stand at the judgment, and God's going to say, I spoke to you audibly from heaven. And you didn't respond. And you're going to be just speechless. Okay. These are all very public declarations that make it crystal clear. So by the time we get to John 12, it's public and it's crystal clear both who Jesus is and why he came. Then we read, and this is where our passage starts tonight, 
Jesus departed and hid himself from them. But how can the light of the world hide himself? That's a good question. John wants us to know that Jesus is hidden in plain sight. So our passage begins with Jesus telling the whole world who he is, and he hides. It's one of those wonderful gospel paradoxes. Is Jesus obvious, or is he hidden? And the answer to that, still today, it's yes. It sort of depends. It, it sort of depends. I don't, know, I don't know how to say it except to say it that way. They're both true. Number two, uh, the Jews failed to see the obvious. For 1,900 years, ever since Abraham, they had been waiting for the Messiah. You just read the Old Testament, and ever since Abraham, he's coming, he's coming. Let's watch for him. The prophets, he's coming, he's coming. But when he came, they didn't recognize him. And this, especially in the first century, must have been the overwhelming question on everybody's mind when Jesus was preached. Well, if he's the Jewish Messiah, why didn't Israel welcome him? Very good question. <laughs> Very good question. Um, what, are we, what are they saying at a Christmas? Po little Jesus boy. They made you be born in a manger. Po little Jesus boy, we didn't know who you is. And I love the bad grammar of it. It's, uh, we didn't no, we didn't think our king would come in a manger or on a donkey or on a cross. No, you didn't. Why, oh, why did Israel not recognize her Messiah? How did the people of God miss God? We're not talking about the pagans. We're talking about Bible-believing, praying, church-going people, moral people. How did they fail to see the light of the world or to hear the voice of God? Remember in the first chapter, in the beginning was the Word. The Word becomes flesh. God is speaking he's, through His Word. How do you not hear if God speaks? How do you not see the light of the world? I'm so glad you asked. Rather than being embarrassed by such questions, the Bible highlights them. You might think that when John was writing this story, he would try to sort of soft pedal the fact that the Jews missed it. It's like, that's a little, that's sort of out of sync with the storyline here, isn't it? Actually, it's not. Uh, and I'm not being anti-Semitic when I talk about the Jews. I'm talking like John talks. I'm just talking because what happened to them still happens to us. I, I assure you. Why? Okay, the, the Bible highlights it. Why? Because this is more than history. It still happens today. God still shows up to church people. And people say, God? I don't see God. <laughs> Wonder how many times that's happened to me today. That God was at work and I was completely oblivious? That is a great question. And I think it's one John wants us to ask. Okay, let's look again at the big picture of John's Gospel. We did this on the first time we met. We have the prologue, and then basically chapters 1 to 12 are the miraculous signs, and there's seven of them. Can anybody remember all seven? First was... Cana of Galilee, water to wine. Second was he healed a nobleman's son. I may, I may miss something. Third, I think, was the pool of Bethesda, the paralyzed man. I think next was feeding a 5,000, walking on water, blind man, and Lazarus. It's that, those are the ones John picked. There are seven signs. It climaxes with the rising of Lazarus, raising of Lazarus. 
And all through that, Jesus has been saying, my hour has not yet come, my hour has not yet come, my hour has not yet come, until last week we saw that Jesus said, the hour has come. When the Greeks come, Jesus says, that's my cue. The hour has come. Next fall, in chapter 13, it's really all about the cross. Climaxing in the raising of Jesus, my hour has come, and it's his private ministry. Jesus reveals himself to his disciples. And so we are right tonight at the hinge moment. Daniel. Isn't it interesting in the seventh sign that, that there is not an exorcism? I don't have any conclusions to draw except it's a great observation to make. John has no demon casting out stories. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have bunches of them. You got any thoughts on that, Dr. Kane? I'm not, yeah? What's that? Yeah. John carefully selected the ones he, he wanted to write about. And he probably knew of Mark's gospel at least. Most people think he probably knew what was written. So he was, he tells us some stories that nobody, no, why didn't they tell the story of Lazarus, Matthew, Mark, and Luke? That's a very good question. Okay, um, so two questions that won't go away. So I'm, I've got the text of scripture right here in your, in your paper, so we're going to use the English Standard Version, but follow in your Bible if you want. But we're in John chapter 12, verse 36b through the end. In these few pregnant verses, John highlights two earth-shaking questions. And the first one is, how did they miss him? So here's the scripture. You're, I'm, I've got some blanks in there for you because I want you to focus on a few things. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs... So John is sort of wrapping up his public ministry. He's done these seven incredible signs before them. They still did not believe. Remember the key verse? These signs are written that you may believe. Well, John says that didn't happen with most of the Jewish nation. He did many signs, but they still did not believe in him so that the word of the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. So don't be surprised that Israel didn't believe. If you knew your Old Testament, you would have known this was going to happen. And this is right in sync with what Israel always did from its very beginning. They missed the cues. They didn't see the obvious. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. What does the arm of the Lord, if you saw the arm of the Lord, what do you think it would look like? Awesome? Powerful? Anybody know what the arm of Zeus, if you're a Greek, what does the arm of Zeus look like? It's got a lightning bolt. Ah, now that's what the arm of the Lord looked like. Where does Isaiah say, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? I put the reference. Isaiah 53, which is the suffering servant. He was like a lamb led to slaughter. He didn't open his mouth. He bore um, um, our sins. He took our diseases. By his stripes we are healed. That's Isaiah 53. That's a revelation of what the arm of the Lord looked like. The suffering servant. Jesus is the arm of the Lord. And it's not Zeus with the thunderbolt. It's Jesus on a cross. It's like that's what omnipotent power looks like. That's what power looks like. Okay. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? 
Who has believed our report? Okay, I'm still reading scripture here. Therefore, they could not believe. Now, the first reference was they did not believe, but now they cannot believe. They can't. It's not just they won't. They can't. They could not believe. And again, he quotes from Isaiah, and this is chapter 6 of Isaiah. God, he, has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. That's a hard verse. Let me just tell you it's quoted four times in the New Testament. And this is the primary verse the New Testament believers used to help them come to grips with the fact that Israel's Messiah came and Israel rejected her Messiah. How do, you, how do you handle that? They quoted Isaiah 6. God has blinded them and hardened their heart so they wouldn't turn and be healed. Okay, let's keep going. We're going to come back. That's a, that's a hard verse. But they couldn't believe because they wouldn't believe. That's what I, you, if you saw your two blanks, they would not believe, therefore they could not believe. That's an important sequence. God's not just arbitrarily deciding who's in and who's out. He's saying, if you won't, then you can't. I don't know how else to say it. I'm intrigued with the theology in John. It's, there's a lot of theology here. Okay. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him, meaning Jesus. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. So, they would not believe, then they could not believe, but some did believe. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus apparently believed, but pretty limp faith because they loved the glory of men. They were secret believers. They might get hurt if they said Jesus' name. You're darn right, you might get killed. That's the book of Acts, which they are killed. Okay, think of all the signs that Jesus has done up to this point. Water to wine, healings, feeding 5,000, walking on water, raising the dead. These were public and verifiable. All you had to do was just go to somebody and say, did he really feed 5,000 people? Ask, there were, there were 15,000 people there who got fed, counting women and children. Just go ask one. Did Lazarus really rise from the dead? It's verifiable. Think of all the words that Jesus has said. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the resurrection and the life. So he's done signs and he's made claims for 12 chapters. And yet people still did not believe. Apparently, God hadn't done enough. <laughs> How much evidence does it take? That is a good question. How much evidence does it take to convince someone of the truth? Perhaps if God spoke audibly from heaven, you say, well, he did. He did that too. And then, not just Lazarus rose from the dead, Jesus rose from the dead. Israel still doesn't believe to this day. How much evidence does it take? And I just quoted John, Luke 16, where Jesus told a parable and concluded it with these words, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Because faith is not ultimately about how much evidence you have. It's about the state of your heart. Okay? Notice that at first the people would not believe then they reached a point where they could not 
believe. This shows both how we are free to examine the evidence and choose to believe or not, but when we choose not to believe, there comes a point when we are no longer in control of our destiny. Humans are free to choose, but not free to control the results of those choices. I don't know if that's the best way to say it or not, but they would not believe, and then God hardened their hearts. They could not believe. God is not surprised by such brazen unbelief from his own people, and we should not be surprised either. The prophet Isaiah foretold this would happen. And I just put the footnote down there. Um, Isaiah 6 is quoted often in the New Testament. Those are the four occasions. This passage was crucial in helping the early church explain why Israel did not recognize Jesus as her Messiah. They would not believe and then they could not believe. And this is not just history. This is how it works today. For those who will not believe, there does come a point when they can't. Where that point is, is between them and God. I don't know, but it's a real one. Um, how are we doing? Let me keep going. I said there's two crucial questions in these, this final part. The first one is, how did they miss him? The second is, what does God really want? And John closes the first half of his gospel with this paragraph. Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, there's the eye thing, the light of the world. Can you see him? Whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I've come into the world as light, so that whoever believes, and believing seems to be a synonym of seeing. To see and to believe are really two ways of saying the same thing so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day, for I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has given Himself has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life, what I say, therefore I say as the Father has told me. And those are the last words Jesus speaks to the world. Now he's going to go into the upper room and talk to the twelve. But with that closes his public ministry in John. What God really wants is for us to see the reality of His Son and what He came to do for us on the cross. But to see, we must have light. Therefore, above everything else, God wants you and me to love the light. I'm going to talk more about that in a moment. But loving light. This is what it means to believe. Um, what happens when a bright light is turned on in a dark closet? I don't know if you've got any of these in your house, or a, a basement's a great illustration of this. What, what happens? Yeah. Let, let me just give some answers. We see the truth of what's really there. So when the light comes on, we see reality. And I love the word reality. I think the word reality and the word true in John are sort of two ways. Of, a lot of people live in unreality. When the light comes on, you see the truth. Now, uh, the second bullet, rats and roaches scurry away because they love the darkness. 
we had a basement in our house in New York, and you'd open the door, you'd just hear little feet scampering. <laughs> it was awful. It's like, don't go down there. It was not a finished basement, but it was a, there were things living down there. But they hated the light. Oh, my goodness. They didn't like the light. Mold hates the light. Fungus. You know, think of all the stuff that loves darkness. That's, that's a parable. And think of the stuff that loves the light. Third bullet, at first, the light is blinding. When you're asleep in the middle of the night and somebody turns on the overhead 100-watt bulb, you know, it's like, oh, my goodness. It didn't help you see. It blinds you. That's a great illustration. When the light of the world shows up, the light that is given to enable us to see may blind us, at least at first. And it may permanently blind some people. Jesus said, I didn't come to judge the world, but he did. <laughs> and it's like, that's what light does. It comes to illuminate, but the very act of illumination blinds. That's exactly right. And four, we make a decision whether to embrace the light or do I just turn out the light and close the closet door and just pretend like I didn't open the door. You know, I, just, I don't want to deal with that. Well, that's a lot of people deal with Jesus that way. I don't want to deal with what he's exposing. Well, you better. You better. Okay? Um, those who reject Jesus have been blinded by light. And that's what I entitled this whole chapter. Blinded by light. Though Jesus did not come to judge them, that, in effect, is the result of his coming. Okay. I've got, now I've got my, my sermon. This is the good stuff. That was all introduction. This is how I want to just make the material come, help the material come alive. How to miss your Messiah. Because I said just a few moments ago, this is not just history. The Messiah still comes. The one we've longed for. He comes in all of his brilliance and radiance. He comes as king. And we still miss him. How does that happen? That's what John is writing to tell us. The Gospel of John tells the tragic story of how the people of God missed their Messiah when he came. What could be more tragic than that? They did not know who he was. Can this still happen today? Is it possible that light comes into our lives through truth, through witnesses, through evidence, and we fail to see God in our midst? Like Israel, we too can miss our Messiah and I've got seven reasons, all right? So this is, this is, this will preach right here. How do we miss our Messiah? A, when we love the wrong things. When we love the wrong things. Jesus said that his purpose for coming into the world was to bear witness to the truth. And then he said to Pilate, everyone who's of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate, and I think Pilate probably said, look, I'm a, I'm a politician. <laughs> Politicians don't deal in truth. Politicians deal in power. And Jesus said, well, then you're not interested in my coming to be your Messiah, are you? And that's exactly right. Because if you're in love with the wrong things, if you love truth... And I've been thinking today how, many, how few people there are in this world who really love truth. Everyone who's of the truth listens to my voice. Truth, like light, exposes things as they really are. If you don't want that, then you don't want Jesus. Um, oh, I'm just thinking of a children's book I should have brought tonight about a Billy Bixby and the 
the, the dragon. Anybody know Billy Bixby and the dragon story? It is, I'll, I'll save that. Um, Jesus explained the unbelief of the Jews this way. Because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. That is an interesting statement. You would think he might say, because I tell you the truth, that's why you're so passionate about following me. I mean, don't, wouldn't you love it if somebody showed up and told you the truth? Welcome to planet Earth. Welcome to life since the Garden of Eden, where we hate the truth. And I'm not just talking about spiritual truth. I'm talking about truth. The bullets. Some love public opinion and care so much about their image that they allow peer pressure to determine what they believe. In John 5, Jesus said, How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from God? If you're more interested in what your friends think than in what God thinks, your Messiah could walk right in front of your face and you wouldn't know who he is. That's what he's saying. You love the wrong things. Third, second bullet, some love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. That's a quote. They hate the light because it exposes who they really are. I, I may have said this a few weeks ago. I said it somewhere. Oh, I may have said it in Florida. But my mother used to say when I was in high school, nothing good happens after 11 o'clock p.m. <laughs> it's dark. It's when it's dark. And I hated it when she would say, I mean, I just say, Mom, what? But she was dead right. She, I, she was dead right. Because sin loves darkness. It, how many sins take place at night? Most of them, maybe. That's where that's those things that scurry around in the dark when you open the door. They hate the light. And if you don't love the light, you will not love Jesus. I promise you. Because he's always exposing things and dealing with reality. And I like to live in my own illusions, thank you very much. La La Land. Our supreme love must be the truth, which is the same thing as saying our supreme love must be Jesus, who is the truth. I am the truth and the way and the life. We will never recognize our Messiah until we love the truth and embrace the light that both exposes our sin, reveals what we truly are, and guides us in the way we should go. Do you love it when the Holy Spirit exposes your sin? That's such a good question. And I'm getting some good smiles that say, I, I think so, <laughs> but not really. But, uh, but it's like going to the doctor. <laughs> you know, it's like just, and the doctor says, we need to have a full exam today. And it's like, oh, please don't do that. Don't do that. Okay, so if you don't love the truth, if you love the wrong things, if you love public opinion, if you love the darkness, if you love your sin, you will not love your Messiah when he comes. That's not just history. That is current events. B, we can miss our Messiah when B, when we don't hear his voice. God loves the whole world, both Jews and Gentiles, everyone. And when his call goes forth, his sheep, whether they are Jews or Gentile sheep, hear his voice. We saw this a few weeks ago. My sheep hear my voice when I call. No, but I think the Gospel of John says, but he's calling everybody. God so loves the world 
The Greeks come to Jesus. We want to see Jesus. John is insisting he's not just calling a select group of people. He's calling everybody. No one becomes a believer in Jesus who has not heard his voice. I'm just going to read that again. No one becomes a believer in Jesus who's not heard his voice. He calls his sheep by name. The question is not, are you called? The question, rather, is, are you listening? So why do people miss their Messiah? Well, he hasn't called me. And I want to say, are you listening? Because I believe he's calling you, if you'll listen. But you won't follow him unless you hear him call your name. That's just, that's so good. C, how we doing? We doing okay? You may miss your Messiah if C, when we refuse to let God define himself. Let God define himself as opposed to me defining God. I, I, some of you have heard my stories, but little seven-year-old Johnny in Sunday school, very intently drawing a picture, and the teacher comes over and says, Johnny, what are you drawing? And Johnny says, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher says to herself, this is a teachable moment. And so she says, Johnny, nobody knows what God looks like. And Johnny says, they will when I finish my picture. <laughs> I, I really like that story because we all think we know what God is supposed to look like, which is exactly what the second commandment that God gave to Moses on Sinai said, don't do. Don't make an image don't try to figure out what you think God looks like because you will get it wrong every time. I promise you. This is, I mean, this is as biblical as anything in the Bible. You don't know what he looks like. That's what the word revelation means. The, the revelation of God is when God says, let me introduce myself. And it starts with Abraham. It's not you're trying to figure out who God is, it's God telling you who he is. Uh, there is. That's the reason for the second commandment, forbids us from making an image of God, because when we define God, we get it wrong every time. The reason we struggle with Jesus' words, for example, when Jesus says, I am the truth, or you must drink my blood, or when we struggle with Jesus' behavior, when he takes a whip and cleanses the temple, or when he rides on a donkey, or when he curses the fig tree. That's an interesting one there. I, that's not in John. When he curses the fig tree. I really, that just sort of blows my categories. I mean, did he swear? I, what? When he cursed the fig tree and killed it. I mean, he, he killed it. <laughs> it's like, that messes with me. Well, it's supposed to. The reason these behaviors trouble us is because he's not conforming to my expectations. I'm saying, God's not supposed to act like that. A king's not supposed to ride a donkey. Jesus shouldn't be using a whip on people. You know, it's like, Jesus, yeah. But that is the whole point of his coming. He wants to reveal the truth about who he really is. And so this is why they missed him. Because the Pharisees sat in their smug little theological ivory towers and said, well, the Messiah, when he comes, he's certainly not going to ride on a donkey. It's like, don't say that. Don't say that. That's your expectation. And it's a false one. Well, when the Messiah comes, he's certainly not going to die on a cross. When the Messiah comes, he's certainly not going to heal people on the Sabbath, for heaven's sake. It's like... Do you listen to the idiocy of what you're saying? It's the, you're missing the obvious. So we can miss God when we refuse to let God define himself. That's a good one. D, are we doing okay? 
We can miss our Messiah D when we confuse cause and effect. I'll have to explain this. But we get cause and effect backward. Most of us think that seeing is believing. In other words, if I could see God, then I would believe him. The Bible says you got it just backwards. No, if you would believe God, then you would see him everywhere. It's like, that is so profound. That just rocks my world. We think if we just had enough evidence, then we would step out in faith. No, it's just the opposite. Standing at the tomb of Lazarus, Jesus told Martha, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see? Jesus teaching that believing is seeing. We don't reason our way into faith. Rather, we believe our way into rationality. I, I love that statement, and I think I thought of it myself, actually. <laughs> but that just really helps me. We don't reason our way into faith. We believe our way into rationality. And someone far smarter than me, Anselm of Canterbury, said, I do not seek to understand that I may believe, but I believe in order to understand. That's just so good. And so the Jews were saying, well, if you just prove to us who you are, then we'd believe. And Jesus says, well, I've turned water to wine, I walked on water, I healed 5,000 people, a voice spoke from heaven, Lazarus is there walking, standing beside you. What would you like me to do? <laughs> it's like, yes, Paul, this is good. Yes, that's, that's in the upper room. You're right. Yeah. So, so, you know, there, there, that really rang a bell there, sister, that really said, you know, that a person who has to be looking at things from that real objective point of view, that there is evidence yeah. constantly. And the Gospel of John gives us 12 chapters of evidence. The, it, John has profound respect for the evidence. But evidence leads to a place that makes faith possible. If you've ever read Pascal, he's one of my heroes, 17th century uh, scientist, French. But he, he basically says it's reasonable to know the limits of reason. In other words, our reason should enable us to come to the point where we say, my reason can't take me where I need to go. And so I think that's what Jesus has been doing with the signs. He says, I'll give you evidence. I'm not asking you to take a leap in the dark. You've got to have something to believe in. But you can't get enough evidence to know God. You know God by faith. You see God by faith, not by sight. I, I, is that, I think we're saying the same thing. Um, and I think of how many people we all know who live with the, sort of the thought, well, if I only had more evidence, I'd be a, I'd be a Christian. But that's nearly always an excuse. And sometimes it's just an outright lie. And a good witness, I think, will gently help them come to grips with, are you, are you honest about that? Or are you playing a game? And an honest seeker, like Thomas, Thomas needed evidence. This is the Gospel of John. We're going to see after the resurrection, Thomas was absent. The one 
Sunday, Jesus showed up. <laughs> you know, that's such a bummer. It's like Jesus always shows up at church when I'm not there. It's a, and a, so they said, Tom, Jesus was at church. And he says, I'm not going to believe. I've got to have more evidence. And Jesus knew Thomas was an honest seeker. And he looked him up and said, Thomas, see my hands, see my feet. And Thomas is on his face saying, my God, I'm sorry. I, it's, no, there's, evidence is not a bad thing. And apologetics, I love apologetics and the need for it. But we need to recognize we can't, I don't care how good our arguments are, we will never enable someone to reason their way to God. It, it won't get you there. I know that's true. Faith gets you there. Faith is the victory. E, we may miss our Messiah. If E, when our goal in life is to get our own way. No one comes to believe in Jesus until they are, quote, willing to do God's will. Go back and look at John 7. We talked about this. If anyone is willing to do God's will, he'll know the truth. That's what Jesus said. But if you're not willing to do God's will, you'll, you'll live in intellectual confusion all your days. That's a profound insight. Self-centered obsession with the goal of getting my own way will blind me to the presence of God forever. You know, when you listen to the discourse going on in Washington, which I have to admit is pretty entertaining, <laughs> but, and you ask the question, how many of these men and women really are interested in truth? I mean, they re on an issue like Climate change. That's a good one, I think. You know, how many people, it's, not, it's politics. It's, it's not really about truth. There's another agenda at work. I know there's exceptions to that. I know there's exceptions. But, uh, but if, you're, if you're obsessed with getting your own way, you'll miss God. We will never come to a knowledge of the truth until in humility, big word, we began to want his will more than our own. How many people miss heaven because of that? F is a, a, a big one here and for us. We may miss God, our Messiah, when we read the Bible the wrong way. I actually think about this verse a good bit. John 5, 39. Jesus said, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And I pause and say, I think that's sort of what I think. <laughs> and Jesus says, that's not a good thing. Scriptures don't give life. The scriptures bear witness to me. I give life. And if you study the scriptures and don't find me, just find something else to do on Tuesday night. You're wasting your time. And Bible study may be a hindrance to seeing who God is, actually than an aid to seeing who he is. Because we're excited about Bible study, not about the one who the Bible talks about. That's different. And sometimes, I have to confess to you, I get so excited about the Bible, I forget the point. When I do that, you are free to stop coming, you are free to rebuke me, whatever you need to do, but uh, that's not a good thing. Ironically, Bible study sometimes is a means of missing our Messiah. The Pharisees probably could quote the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. I mean, just quote it. They knew their Bibles, and they missed 
God. They strained at a gnat and swallowed a camel. That's how Jesus said it. They tithed mint, dill, and cumin, but they overlooked justice, mercy, and truth. Oops. <laughs> it's like they got their tithing of their spices right, but they missed justice, mercy, and truth. The goal of Bible study is not to know the Bible, but to know Him. Somebody can say amen there if you'd like. G, we can miss our Messiah when we don't feel we need what he came to offer. Though Jesus has the ability to heal the sick and feed the hungry, I like when he offers that. And remember when he fed the 5,000, there was a movement to make Jesus king. They were going to write him in as a write-in candidate in the next election. You know, we can, do, we can pull this off. He can, he's got a chicken in every pot. I mean, what's better than a king that'll do that? And Jesus, he ran and hid from them. He said, I am not that kind of king. I can do that, and I actually care about the hungry, and I want you to care about the hungry, but that's not why I came. I didn't come to heal the sick or to feed the hungry or even to raise the dead, though I am concerned about those things. Why did he come? John the Baptist said it the first day we met him. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If my interest in God is only that he will make me healthy, wealthy, and happy, then chances are good I'll not recognize my Messiah even if he walks in the door. That's just so good. No, no thanks, Jesus. I'm not interested in deliverance from sin. I just want more health, wealth, and happiness. Yeah. That's a great statement. June is saying that a lot of people that she was in Congo, I'm repeating this partly for our video. I, people write that watch our videos and they tell us, when people ask questions, you need to repeat it. But that you were in Congo when the Asbury Revival came in 1970 and you regretted not being here. And was it the Lord that told you that? or you? It came to my heart. It, yeah. You're right. But that there were people in Wilmore who missed the revival. That's so good. So, how did they miss him? How do we miss him? If you love the wrong things. If you're not in love with truth. If you don't love it when the light shines in your darkness. Even if it makes you squirm. You may miss him. If you don't hear his voice, and I just want to tell you my theology, I believe he's calling all of our names. And the problem is not that he's not calling. The problem is we're not listening. To quote my mother again, she used to say, get the potatoes out of your ears. <laughs> I always, always like that. In other words, the, the problem is not your mother's voice. The problem is the potatoes in your ears. And... Uh, I think about these things at this stage of life, but the problem is not that God is not speaking. The problem is we're not listening. C, when we refuse to let God define himself. We're little Johnny drawing a picture of how we think God is supposed to act. That, will, that is the second commandment. Don't do it. Don't do it. Let him define himself. D, when we confuse cause and effect when we think seeing is believing rather than believing is seeing. When, we, when our goal in life is to get my way, not his way. When we read the Bible to know the Bible 
rather than to know him. And then G, when we don't feel we're really interested in this deliverance from sin stuff. We, we just want to be healed and fed and raised from the dead. Point of no return. I'm told there, there is a place on the Niagara River above the falls which is designated the point of no return. Regardless of the craft you're in, once this point is passed, you will go over the falls. The current is just too strong to resist. So whether you're in a canoe or whether you're in a 400 power, uh, horsepower motorboat, you'll go over. The current is just too strong. Similarly, there is a point of no return in our spiritual lives. Refusing the Messiah who comes for us is serious business. We're in the Niagara River and the current is building string, steam. At first, we may choose not to believe, but if we continue in such willful unbelief, key phrase, willful unbelief, the day will come when we cannot believe. We reach the point of no return when God himself blinds our eyes and hardens our hearts in a permanent manner which is what I think is happening at John 12. And what's in, working on me right now is but Jesus hasn't even died on the cross yet. But yet, he's withdrawing himself and saying, but I've, I've basically given you all the evidence you're going to get. You're still going to see me lifted up, and I'm going to raise from the dead. And some will come, but I think the die was pretty cast even there. Because when he rose from the dead, the Pharisees, they said, somebody stole his body. <laughs> it's obviously the disciples, and they bribed the people. I mean, it just, the plot just gets awful. So, therefore, these are our last three points. Today, if you hear his voice, if he's speaking, respond. Today, if you see the light, because tomorrow you may not, if you haven't responded. And then three, John 12 is not only when Jesus says the hour is come, it is also the moment when each of us must say the hour has come. A decision must be made. And then to quote, is it Hamlet or Macbeth? to be or not to be, but I think the gospel says to believe or not to believe. That is the question. That's the question. Daniel. So is the, 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 the cursing of the fig tree, oh. is that an illustration of this? In what way? Well, um, he came and there was no fruit and he said, all right, uh, uh, then, I love the way your mind works, Daniel. I've never thought of that. I think so. Because it happened right after he yeah. And, and it was an acted parable. I mean, it's obvious, I, I think, he's not just having a bad day. He, he's illustrating something, that he had been in the temple that was fruitless. The fig tree should have borne fruit, but it didn't and he cursed it. The next day, it was withered to the roots, I think is what, yeah. So it had reached the point of no Yes, return. I think so. It was, it, it yes. Well said. I, I like very much what you're saying. Point. And I think that's what's going on in John 12. It's like Jesus said, I'm done with the world. I've, I've done everything I came to do. I'm still going to die. I'm going to rise. There's still hope. It's not the close of human history yet. But let those whose hearts are hard be, hard, be hardened still. Um, sort of idea. Thank you. Just a quick, simple thought. The, the fish in Mammoth Cave can't see because they haven't looked at light. And now their, their eyes are covered or covered over. Yeah. They cannot see the light. And I just think it's kind of what we're talking about here, uh, that they just cannot see. If you can take them out, they still can't see them. 
God has to touch our eyes and our ears to enable us to see the light. Okay, this is good. Um, next week, I'm pretty sure we're going to talk about water. Uh, and it's a real theme, everything from baptism to water to wine, the woman at the well, the rivers of living water. There's a lot of water running through John and the Bible, but I want to I wanna really live with that for a while. Um, but I got some other ideas, but I'll be doing it week to week. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Wow, it's a privilege with these dear, dear men and women to just do what we're doing. And we pray that you just continue to take your word and work it deep into our minds and into our hearts. And Lord, most of all, we pray that Bible study wouldn't cause us to miss you. That's such a sobering thought that the whole point of what we're doing is not to know a book, it's to know you. And we thank you for the book that makes that possible. So you, uh, through your spirit, draw us to yourself even tonight as we sleep. Keep us safe as we travel and bring us together again. In Jesus' name, amen.